Educate, entertain, enjoy. You're listening to Aspen Waite Radio. You're actually listening to me, and it's Paul Waite, and it's Monday. It's the 17th of May, and I have my special guest today, Lara Honeyball. A very, very warm welcome to you, Lara. Good morning, Paul. Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah, Laura, Laura usually has her hair in a different different style, so she's got it down today for you listeners. I just had to get up early, so it's just I just put it in plaits so I didn't have to bother with it. <laughs> so um, who is Laura Honeyball? So Laura Honeyball is uh, a young lady with uh, an amazing amount of talent. Um, we'll come on to talk to uh, to her about her career, uh, but working with um, huge national, you know, huge corporations like Coca Cola, um, where she produced some fantastic images. Um, fortunate enough to be able to um, bring Lara into the Aspen Waite family at the start of the year. And um, I said to Lara while we were talking off off station, so to speak, um, <laughs> that. Um, it's interesting, you know, when you, if you, that's why I was going on about if you judge the book by the cover, then you judge the book by the lover. Uh, mm-hmm. So Lara, on the face of it, is quite an understated lady, you know, not a person to shout out about herself at all. Um, but the more you, the more you look, the more you see the layers. Um, so um, L- Lara referred to herself as an onion, but I'd like to say uh, <laughs> there's a theme here. You'll see when you listen to Lara extolling about what makes Lara Honeyball, who she is and what she believes in. There's a great story here, lots of um, depth to her, I would say, and um, happiness would be a, a recurring feature. So, Lara Honeyball is an onion that makes you laugh, doesn't make you I, cry. I would say a shallot, because I kind of feel it's a little <laughs> bit smaller and less stinky. I like to think I shower a bit more than a regular onion, so yeah. look, can we go with a shallot? It oh, okay. also sounds a bit nicer, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, but Zoe, Ball, <laughs> but Zoe Ball doesn't talk about shallots at nine o'clock. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, I guess um, so. You um, you were an only child, Lara. Um, yeah. So how do you think that? Did, how do you think that affected you as a child and your career, if at all? No, of course. So I think I've been creative as long as I can remember, and I think as an only child, you you quickly learn you can't like crack Cluedo by yourself and performing <laughs> the musical for your parents with only one cat just doesn't have the wow factor of the West End, does it? Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to get I was kind of forced to get creative in a good way. So I made my own board games. I designed a Barbie's wow. apartment completely out of shelving units you know I made all the furniture I did all the backdrops for that and I trained my cats to perform for me on a Sunday night and I even created my own drama club at school with my friends which they hated me for and in fact I think they probably still do Mm -hmm. um but essentially I think I had a lot of I think I was saying to you the other day I had a lot of time to like wonder and daydream and often found ways to make those daydreams a reality so I think for me I'm really thankful for being an only child because I believe it really helped me to unlock that creativity and really Mm. realize and tap into that passion and potential um like I said you just you just get creative (laughs) when you're by yourself (laughs) were books um an important part of your childhood at all Oh, yeah, I loved reading. I loved Roald Dahl as well and being sort of like transported into mm-hmm. those magical worlds. Yeah. Um, oh God, do you know what was really embarrassing? Me and Ben, my partner, were out the other day and we were in Waterstones and, you know, Ben's picking up all his crime novels, which I normally read and I have, mm. you know, like an extensive list of really great books but the mm-hmm. one I really wanted that really stood out to me was this book called Starting School and it's so simple it's a child's book but I remember those illustrations and I remember the graphics in those books and I remember like instantly like, all those feelings of being a child came flooding back to me so it just shows the mm-hmm. importance and power of like visuals and graphics and design um I could have picked any book but I picked a child's book so, just sharing yeah. a story with you there Lara um yeah. so like you so when i was a, a child i used to be my brain was usually on some planet um <laughs> with some hero that um was saving women and and, and and fighting various adversaries um i used to go to a bookshop called read and return and it's a true story um and i guess you know l- 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 going on a few years it's not a surprise i guess that i'm so interested in in visuals so mm. I, I actually would often buy a book because of the cover um, because the imagery on the on the front cover was so so great that I would buy the book. Is that no, something yeah. you can relate to? 
Oh, absolutely. But I kind of, it's kind of hit and miss for me. So sometimes the cover is amazing. And then when the story or the or the message does it justice as well, that's even better. I've often sometimes been drawn in by an amazing cover and then been let down a little bit by the story. But I don't know if that's because my, you know, expectations are too high based on how good the cover was. Mm-hmm. But yeah, absolutely. I think you, you need, you need an important visual to draw people in. Otherwise, how else are you going to sell your, you know, your service or your book or your story? So would you say you were a bossy person or are you just nicely coercive? <laughs> I'm not bossy. I don't think I have a bossy bone in my body. I think I'm I'm a team player, but I can also work well on my own. And I think mm-hmm. I'm I'm my harshest critic. So yeah, I wouldn't say I was bossy. Okay. I like I like to get things done and I like I like fairness. I think that's a, a yeah, good, that's way a good, to good concept. I think everything should be fair. So when it came to um, the choice of your GCSEs, etc., mm. um, who drove that? Was that you basically saying, hey, mum and dad, I'm doing fine art? Or or did they say, hey, you're pretty good at this stuff, kid, you know? They were really good, actually. My mum is so wise, well, my dad as well, so wise. So I, they knew from early on that I wanted to do, you know, fine art and graphics and fact, mm-hmm. every, anything creative. But they're also wise in the sense that, you know, you can't, you don't, at that age, you don't quite know if it's going to go somewhere or not. So you have to, you know, you do have to have academic subjects as well. So, I mean, with G- with GCSE, my mum kindly asked the school if I could drop out of maths and geography <laughs> because yeah. it just wasn't my strong point. And she just wanted me to put all my energy into something I was good at. Mm-hmm. And then when it came to GCSEs and A-level, she said, you know, follow your path, follow your dream do those creative subjects but just maybe do English language in the background um just so you have something you know academic to fall back on just in case which I think has really helped my writing skills mm-hmm. um and then ever since sort of GCSE they've been fully behind me and really supported me all the way and they've just been there no matter what like no matter what challenge I think my mum was up in GCSE at 2 a.m in the morning helping me with my graphics project wow so this yeah, um, creative arts diploma you've got, what is that? Is that an HNC or something? Or, or... Yeah, so you can either go straight from GCSE um, and A-level. So you can either go straight from A-level to uni, or you mm. can almost do this year in between, and it's mm. a foundation, like national foundation diploma in art and design, mm-hmm. and you choose you choose a pathway. So um, you either choose graphic design, uh, photography, fine art or fashion. And it just really helps you prepare for uni, Mm -hmm. but also give you those kind of extra credits. So I chose, it's really weird. I chose again with the diploma and with the uh, uni course, I chose photography. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I think I was just trying to find an outlet of ways I could be creative, Mm. sort of like in an extraordinary way. Um, so that yeah in that year doing the arts diploma it was all about pushing the boundaries and exploring really risque subjects which like without oh, very much like trumpet, what I, think, uh, I don't think i can say on radio paul really mm-hmm. yeah not that, no. <laughs> not that risque gosh you must tell me I'm it was like intrigued. exploring like sexuality and reproduction really? like, I, I wanted oh. to take on subjects that oh. people found difficult to talk about yeah i don't want to get you too excited on a uh, monday so yeah, we've got all the all our listeners across listener land <laughs> are excited but you'll never know yeah, but if you send me an email i might tell you what i find out okay but yeah i took a detour and i studied photography at uni and i kind of soon realized i was breaking all the photography rules so i was, was creating more graphic digital collages that were combined with classic analog photography and that Ooh. kind of made me really realize my passion and talent really lied within graphic design and because you could really sort of push the boundaries of design without any rules mm-hmm. um so yeah it was weird i i did fine art at, at school i did graphics um and then i moved on photography and i've come back to graphic so i've done a bit of a cycle mm. <laughs> was this the cheesy <laughs> joke then about a bit of a cycle because of course ben is uh, often to be found on an inferior bike because he's not a proper proper <laughs> cyclist but there we are mm-hmm. uh, have you been known to join him on a bicycle oh no absolutely Good. not i'm, I'm into 90s dance workout it's a little bit oh. less hardcore <laughs> for me funky <laughs> that's cool so actually i think you know laura's one of those guests where uh, you could literally talk to her for about five hours. And um, <laughs> as I say, apart from the fact she's uh, genuinely um, got an amazing career and it's really nice to to uh, come across someone who, um, you know, knew quite early on, you know, where their talent was and, and, and was quite driven, but in a very, very nice way and has made uh, a lot of very good decisions, I think. And um, as we'll come on, I think the when, when, we, when we get on to your musical choices and we're going to do the first one in a minute, mm. Um, I was rather struck by um, 
the 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 heart and the depth that lay behind your choices so um what's your first musical memory that you can think of Oh, gosh. So for me, I think music's always been really important to me. So my dad's a drummer in his spare time. Yeah. Um, and I kind of feel like whilst most children went to play parks and mm -hmm. they did, you know, the usual play park thing, I was going to gigs. So my dad was taking me to go see my earliest memory was probably Motorhead. Um, mm -hmm. And we've also gone and seen Adam and the Ants together, mm -hmm. like music was really important in our family mm -hmm. and also with me and even things like um just bedtime stories we play music and uh -huh. I just have really strong memories of like great childhood linked to music so it's always been important to me so it's um it's a bit like sort of coming home working uh working here or being on this interview <laughs> today for instance yeah absolutely so um let's, let's uh, your first track today is by um one of the greats of all time Neil Diamond um, I'm not actually particularly familiar with this track, but I love the reason why you picked it. So the track is Thank the Lord for the Night Time. And tell everyone mm. why this song is so special to you. So, yeah, not many people have heard of this song, but Neil Diamond really connects me to my grandparents, who we sadly lost within six weeks of each other when I was literally just a baby. Um, I never knew them personally, but I feel very spiritually connected to them. And I believe my creativity really comes from my grandpa. They love Neil Diamond. And although this wasn't their favourite song, it really yeah. reminds me to live life to the fullest for them, um, to have fun, be creative and make incredible memories with the most important people in my life. And, you know, I think that's why sometimes me and Ben uh, dance badly around the kitchen to it these days um, oh. and I listen to it you know when I'm being creative because it in encourages me to you know do the best that I can. So um, you use the word spiritual so mm. you know would you say you, are you a person with faith or do you believe in in, in anything particularly? No. You know? I'm not Obviously, religious, but um, I do have little sort of things in life. Like I don't know how my mum would feel about me saying this on, on, on air, but we believe every time we see two white butterflies, which is quite okay. rare to see together, that's my grandparents because oh, of something okay. she went through. So like I do, I, I am very spiritual, but I wouldn't say I was religious. Okay. Right. So um, take it away, Drew. And it's Neil Diamond. Aspen, Aspen Wait Radio. Call Wait. Anyway, so um, you successfully got your degree at university, albeit mm -hmm. in your own rather random way. Um, so to, I, I rather liked you were like a disruptive force in photography, <laughs> um, but obviously decided that um, a, a more creative sort of design career. Mm -hmm. So how did you get this this job in the small design agency? Was that how did you how did you get introduced to that? So weirdly, my parents were doing a, they, their house um, property developers and they were doing a, a build down a, like a small country lane in Wokingham and yeah. they got chatting to the neighbour who, who owned a graphic design agency and who used to be in London, but he bought it all back down to his shed in Wokingham. Um, and I was kind of at that point where I, I don't know if this is still the same today, but I just thought if you if you want to get where you want to be in life, you you you've got to be willing to work for free so I just offered mm. offered myself and was like um you know I've just done graphic design at uni I'm really really keen to get into the industry mm. I'll, I'll work for free can you just take me on for some experience and I worked there for two months like for, for free and then thank well not thankfully someone left <laughs> and then he offered me a full-time position and that's where I was for about three years and I learned everything from traditional print and web design to filming and editing and animating e-learning programs and I just used it as a chance to really learn um and it was, it was quite a weird experience because you're in this you feel inside like you're in this creative agency in London and then you walk out the back door and you walk into this guy's back garden there's chickens running around yeah, like yeah. dogs cats it's like a real surreal experience but I think and it's one of my tips for future designers I, I would say like work for free where you can just gain as much experience as possible because a lot of agencies won't take you without experience so you've got to be willing to you know try and work for free where you can so really you've sort of got a um you, you sort of understand all aspects of a marketing agency um mm. including i was interested in the web design thing so um uh also uh, the animation is that something you could still do or do do 
I try. So I know very basic animation, but I'm all for learning. So I try just for fun as projects on the side at weekends to try and learn as much animation as I can. There's also like tools and software out there to help you. So if you're trying to get into it, there's, you know, some tools online, like websites that help you sort of build animations um, on that platform whilst you're getting used to the transitions and how it all works. But again, it's, it's practice. It's just if you're passionate about something, always put the time and effort in to learn as much as you can about it. So you started off. So I think, you know, I think uh, I, I thoroughly applaud your attitude and how you got started. I think it's um, mm -hmm. um, playing the long game, not, not yeah. the short game, which I think is a lot of people don't do. Um, so you've got a good diverse range of skills cut your teeth, we're good at what you did. Um, what 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 would you say drove you and continues to drive you in terms of why did you then move from that small agency? What what is it, you know, what is it that success means to you or or fulfillment even? I think it was just just being young and being there for three years. Like I, I do believe that, you know, if you, if you trust somewhere and you love somewhere, I'm fiercely loyal. I'll stay there for life if I can. But as a young designer, you need to sort of explore what else is out there. So like the degree, I tried photography, I tried graphic yeah. design, I tried fashion. Like you need to kind of understand. I worked in a an agency environment I was like Do you know what I wonder what it's like to work in corporate so what's it like to work for one brand in particular so I went to free mobile in um, Maidenhead the head office there and I worked with the brand team um, and I learned I realized you know my skills were lacking slightly in digital design and website yeah. and app build and I was like Do you know what? I don't just want to know you know, I don't just want to learn about, you know, graphic design for, for yeah. web and app. I want to learn the inner workings of it. So UX, I don't know if you know about UX and UI and user testing. Mm -hmm. It was all like the kind of geeky stuff behind web design, like how do users behave? I want to know if I'm designing this nice website, I want to know where users are going. I want to know what's it, what's making, helping them choose that decision of where they're going to go. So it was kind of, I just wanted, again, to learn as much as I could um and again i was there uh, two years before i realized i missed being able to do everything not just one brand okay so i went for a short stint at a marketing agency that specialized in automotive brands like bmw mm. mini and rolls royce and that was really lovely because they have really beautiful brand guidelines and assets mm -hmm. and it was just taking this you'd love it paul like lovely imagery and making really nice brochures out of it and sort of gift packs and, and training manuals um and then finally again i was still in my experimentation stage but then i found i moved to, sorry what does that mean what does experimentation stage mean just kind of trying to understand and learn and tap into what i enjoyed the most out of graphic oh, okay. design like whether i wanted to stick to doing a bit of everything or if i wanted to specialize in one specific skill or area mm -hmm. um thankfully i've i've stuck with i love a bit of everything <laughs> which makes me hopefully a bit more versatile yeah so I moved to a big experiential marketing agency um, down the road, actually, for three years where I got to design and create brand experiences like events mm -hmm. and PR stunts for those clients you mentioned, like Coca-Cola, Superdrug, Unilever. And again, what I loved about that is I got to do the graphic design, but it was conceptual design. So it was a lot of thinking um and creating experiences for people out of a brand so you could you could literally do anything it was amazing it must be so when you were when you're working for someone like coca-cola mm. obviously it must be a very impersonal thing do you just get given sort of very strict guidelines to follow do you know what you you do you get very strict visual brand guidelines but they're they're actually very open to creativity and they're very collaborative i've done a lot of sessions with them especially in the pandemic over zoom where we all sort of butted our heads together and kind of came up with creative all together so they are very open to sort of change and um, exploring new ideas and especially when it came to the events marketing like th they would be very strict like this is our can this is what it looks like this is the advert but beyond that the experience you create for our fans is completely up to you like be as wild and wacky as you want really so did you ever get to um to draw father christmas on the coca-cola lorry <laughs> no so uh, i was really sad about that we had this great <laughs> um campaign and sort of stint lined up for coca-cola christmas this year but sadly because of covid it didn't go ahead um i think i'd left at that point so they might have done it digitally um but oh yeah it's nothing better than that feeling is it seeing the coca-cola truck at christmas 
So do you, uh, I read somewhere once that um, there's something like 10 different ways that people think, you know, mm. do, do you think in images? Are you conscious of how you actually think? Yeah, I, I think I think in images. Like, I have this weird thing where I can't, so if you were, if I was to write a sentence, for example, in my head and visually it looks completely right and then someone will come along and be like you've you've sort of done that backwards like you've put the ending of the sentence first and you've mm. got, like my brain is constantly whirring and I'm thinking mm. more about the visual side so if I'm writing a sentence I'm thinking what would that look like as a magazine cover or a brochure like what would that look like as an image I'm trying to convey mm -hmm. um so yeah definitely visual okay um and um it's interesting this because uh uh, in 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 your briefing notes, you know, we talked about people you mm. admire. So there's no actual creative designer you admire, but you admire a photographer <laughs> called Tim Walker. Why is that? I just think inspiration. Like when when you're a graphic designer or a designer, everyone always says, "Oh, who's your favorite?" You know, graphic designer or painter. And I, I kind of am a strong believer of inspiration can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So photographer Tim Walker, I think for me, he's more than just a photographer for Vogue and all the big fashion magazines. He's a visual storyteller, and I'm not sure if you've seen his work, but it's it's so much more than capturing clothes like every photo shoot is like a love letter to an object <laughs> or often several objects and the only way I can describe it is he creates like daydreams on paper so like these oh, Alice lovely. in Wonderland-esque yeah. images in eerie settings so you could be like a floating tea party in like a shadowy oh. forest or mm -hmm. a ghostly like derelict doll's house along with like this bizarre array of props and it kind of immediately captures the attention of the beholder and i just love his mantra that a photo isn't finished until he's taken it as far as he can go and that's always inspired me to really push the boundaries and really celebrate the extraordinary okay when it comes to film you say that um you're a big fan of wes anderson so what, mm. what is what is mr anderson doing that's floating your boat so he's a, yeah, again, not a traditional artist, but he's a film director. And I take a lot of inspiration from Wes Anderson films and his like dreamlike cinematography. So most significantly, um, a film called Moonrise Kingdom and Grand Budapest Hotel. He has this like incredible taste mm -hmm. for colour and style. And he kind of like blends them into this psychological scene that really takes you on a visual journey. And mm -hmm. that's always been my goal of design. I remember seeing Moonrise Kingdom by accident, actually, in a mm -hmm. tiny cinema in Paris when it was chucking it down with rain. And I was so transfixed in this visual journey that I lost all sense of where I was. And when I walked out of that cinema, I just thought, Do you know what? I want to have that effect on people. Like I want to oh, visually brilliant. transport people to some amazing places and forget where they are and who they are for a moment. <sighs> Quite ambitious, really, isn't it? <laughs> no, so rather, rather beautiful, actually. Um, so um, we're going to move on to your next uh, track, which, um, mm. which of course has to be true. I love to boogie. We all love to boogie, <laughs> don't we? Uh, not, not so many men, but um, I certainly, uh, I certainly been known to strut my stuff and from time to time. Um, Left the Boogie <laughs> by Mark Bolin. Um, you said something really fascinating, which I, I thought I had to talk to you about. Mm. Um, so this is a Lara Honeywell quote. All the best ideas happen when you're having fun. Yes. Is that, is that, that, that's, that's, what, that's, your, that's your belief, is it? That uh, you get all your I great just... ideas when you yeah i think you can get really bogged down by deadlines and i'm not saying deadlines aren't important but this this song is like my absolute go-to when i'm feeling really creatively stuck and i'm being when i get stuck creatively i'm really hard on myself and that creates a block where i just can't see any way out of it and i literally my go-to is to put this song on let loose and just dance really badly around the room and relax my mind and that's when the creativity really flows back because I just like you said I just I believe all the best ideas happen when you're relaxed and having fun and mm. I mean yeah I'm hoping you'll join me with this one have a little a little boogie oh lovely and Ross is bringing a cup of tea mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's Mark Bolan and T-Rex so let's hope you all boogie across Aspen Weight Listener Land this is Paul Waite on Aspen Waite Radio. So um, I think Mark Bolin, one of the greats um, of all time. He used to dress uh, very creatively, didn't he? Yeah, oh, no, yeah. I think mm -hmm. he's a huge influence. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, um, so Laura's got an awful lot to say, so we're going to get into some quite <laughs> deep stuff now. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your, um, your career highlight, which you say was uh, at the Superdrug Health and Beauty Expo. So... Mm -hmm. What was so special about that? 
so this was a really special project for me like my creative director and I along with a very small team pitched the idea of a health and beauty playground super drug for all their brands where consumers could explore test learn and play with some of the latest tens, trends and graphics um Oh, sorry, I've lost my train. Uh, product, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is this is what I mean. I go off into this like visual wonderland. And I'm just like, oh. Well, you were there, there, weren't you? You were back. You were back <laughs> yeah. in the past. <laughs> oh, so all I could think about was the stress of how much, gra- how many graphics we had to create. Um, and they approved this amazing concept, but the only problem was we had literally a matter of weeks to make it a reality. Mm-hmm. So we had to not only design the overall super drug led areas and the interactive elements and experiences such as photo ops, games, meet and greets, and masterclasses within the expo but we also had to conceptualize and create up to 20 brands individual stands and experiences and just to understand the scale of work for just one brand so a makeup brand might come to us for example and would want to feature their wonder lash mascara so this would maybe inspire us to create a wonderland-esque stand that's two by two meters that included an experience such as a game that incorporated the product like a whimsical photo op and all the set dressing for the stand so for example did the mascara sit on an enchanted ferris wheel you know as product shelving um we also had to do the uniform for all the staff and the freebies that that brand would give out and all the graphic design for that so we had to think of ideas on that scale for over 20 brands on top of the event as a whole and that's before even before it went into production to be built and installed and we probably had about eight weeks total to do that so it was a Mm -hmm. huge challenge and a lot of really long nights in London but the outcome was just so overwhelming rewarding like the night before the expo the roof caved in um due to flooding and everything was trash so weeks of hard work was just annihilated (laughs) and I, I feel really guilty for this I was going on holiday the next day so I wasn't there but the poor team had to work through the night to salvage it and they did this amazing job like you would never have known it happened and the event actually went live whilst I was flying to Florida and I'll never forget checking my phone when I landed in the Florida sun and it hit my skin and it was just really emotional like the first thing you know I'm, I'm going to Disney World the first thing I when I get off that plane I should be like Mickey Minnie yeah. but the first thing I thought was super drug expo and I checked yeah. it on my phone and it was just so emotional to see all our hard work praised and shared online by both the public but also we had a lot of celebrity interest and there was a lot of tv shows filming there and it was just a really emotional experience to think you know, that small group of us in that tiny office like helped cre- create this experience that people just walked into in london and it was just amazing so i guess something like that would have cost hundreds of thousands of pounds would it yeah i mean i, I never ever found out how much it cost or was put aside for i don't know if i'm mm. allowed to say either but it costs a lot of money and i think you'd be surprised like just even creating clouds out of like polystyrene and like Mm. foam and things like it it all adds up and we have to it's not just about being creative you have to think about your budget and you have to think okay i've made this amazing idea is it actually possible to build and how much is it is it going to fall within budget of course that's another big part yeah so right moving on to some more deep stuff from lara (laughs) Uh, so lara says she writes from the soul uh and i love this um embracing the fact that i like a filter Oh, what I have no filter. No, I, I yeah. have. I think that was a typo. Like, I'm not. I'm not a writer in by any means, but I just really love writing, and I like to write from the soul. Like, I don't have a filter, and but I like to embrace that. I think it's really good to be like raw, honest, passionate, and hopefully inspiring. Like, mm-hmm. I love to use really bold, powerful, inspirational statements and quotes to draw people in and make mm. them think. And to me that I think that I think you'll agree that's really important with branding and marketing. Like I don't people don't want to be sold to or talked at. They want to feel inspired and empowered and feel as though that brand is directly talking to them in a truly and honest way. Like I did have a question for you, Paul, and it's Ooh. about selling a pen and I I hope yeah. you picked the right answer. But it's just as an example, like if you're selling, if you're BIC and you're selling a pen for writers mm. and you're gonna use a tagline, like which tagline do you think sells it best like i'm not very good um voicing this so Go on. i'll try so big crystal ballpoint pen get a pen that you can rely on or would you go with your life is your story write it well write it often and write it with big which one would the latter by a landslide 
Okay, good. <laughs> Correct answer. <laughs> I was a bit worried then. If you picked the wrong one, I didn't know where I was going to go. Oh, come on, man. I have faith. Come on. I am a marketing you, you genius. Just, come on. But you surely, yeah, you feel empowered by the second one. And it's completely two different. Complete. It's like yeah. You know, it's like chalk and cheese. Those two, aren't they? And I don't know. I know they do it deliberately. But there's a brand, the yeah. drinks company Oasis, also run by Coca Cola, and they had a really good campaign a few summers ago. And they were just brutally honest. And I know the humour and the honesty was part of it. But they were like, yeah. you know, it's summer, it's hot, you're thirsty, we've got sales targets. Here you go. Here's a here's an Oasis summer fruits. And I just thought it was yeah. genius. And I just think I love to like inject humour into my writing. I think mm-hmm. comic relief is a wonderful thing and mm-hmm. it's helped me overcome some really big challenges in my life. So I think it's yeah, a combination of those things. And I think that's really important in branding and marketing as well, as I'm sure you'll agree. How difficult is it to um, design a powerful, impactful image while at the same time um, having to come up with um, appropriate words, a strap line <laughs> for that? And, and also, I guess, in... The world of a larger agency would that be done by the same person or would you have uh someone in charge of images then a separate person doing the words so in a larger agency you probably have a copywriter coming up with the tagline or the headlines or the campaign line and strategy so they would produce the headline for you and then the graphic designer would find the imagery to sort of accompany that um and what I really like about our company is it's it's kind of like a group thing, isn't it? We kind of we find the words that we feel are really true to ourselves and feel right. And then hopefully like in future, like you and me work together to find that right image that helps encompass that. But yeah, I think I think the bigger the agency you go, you, you, you separate into sort of environments. So you have copyright and design. And then in smaller agencies, it's a bit more collaborative, which I really love. Yeah, it's very difficult to know what to talk about next with you because um, <laughs> we've got uh, we've got twelve minutes of Lara, and there's so many things I want to talk about um, just to set the scene. So I think it's um, very important that we talk about the importance of brand um, mm. and how how people should um, recognise a brand, how to develop it, what yeah. things to do and what not to do uh, over the years with that brand. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also going to talk about um, tips for budding designers and of course um i also want to talk about um aspen weight of course because after all that's what we are so Mm -hmm. um for all of you listening today um aspen weight has um a world-class marketing team um i've got a bit lucky i suppose in some respects so on the whole the the team is pretty young i'd say um uh as well the wonderful um little little story i'll tell you um this might seem a bit odd so i love what i love agatha Agatha christie so i like miss marple and hercule poirot and um there was an episode i was watching a few weeks ago um and marty mccutcheon played a chambermaid who was an amateur sleuth uh and obviously you know was very struck by jane marple and um at the end of the at the end of the the program uh they're in the car park and um uh and uh Marty McCutcheon turns around to Jane Marple and says, um, uh, have you any tips for, um, you know, how am I ever going to be as good as you? And Jane Marple just says, get older. <laughs> and wiser, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, that's, I think the point is, is that, um, you know, so if you if you were to control, I'm not, you know, so obviously I'm not um, uh, anything like a, a competitor of yours in, 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 in most of your job sense, but... Um, you know, one one of the things that obviously having a, a rich career in business gives you is, is a huge amount of experience. So, mm. you know, most of the time when I'm in a meeting, I'm able to draw on real things that have happened as opposed to uh, you You will still be coming across things for the first time, I expect. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that there's a big difference between uh, how you would approach, how you probably would approach um working for say coca-cola and working for aspen weight mm. uh, you know they are quite different and i think how, how important do you think know your client is in your job oh extremely important like they're looking to they're looking towards you for trust and guidance um but you can't really create them amazing things without truly understanding and knowing your client like and i think it's really important when you get a new client to really sort of take the time to get to know them and understand their values you know and all the really important things that help build their brand and their company so that you can help sort of create that and recreate that visually so they can shout louder and prouder about it Right, so coming on to your last uh, selection now, 
Uh, well, I want to leave us with about 15 minutes of quality <laughs> Lara input. So um, this, uh, this, is, uh, this, this little interview has been everything I wanted it to be. So let's talk about um, The Associates, which I believe this song, oh. particular song, uh, was introduced uh, by your father. So um, what, what does this song mean for you? So it's a bit of a weird song choice, but this song is like really bizarre for me. So I kind of feel like it takes me places and to a time that I never actually existed within. And it makes me feel really euphoric. So my dad introduced this song to me and I was instantly hooked. It's the only song I can play on piano. And despite being born in 1988, it like transports me back to the 80s. And it makes me feel this like weird nostalgic rush through my body as though I actually lived through that time. So, you know, that uh -huh, sense of deja uh -huh. vu and nostalgia, I feel all that, but I'm like, I never, I was, I wasn't even alive. I was a little, you know, little egg. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is, um, it's a great song from the associates. Um, they've actually gone down now. Um, we'll, we'll come on to why uh, after the song, uh, they've become a bit of a cult band, uh, hugely liked by people like Bjork, um, uh, Bono, for instance, um, there's another female singer I can't really think, think of at the moment, but they, um, uh, oh, Robert Smith of The Cure, for instance, is a huge fan of The Associates. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a song that was a number nine hit in 1982, uh, and it's just really quirky and a great song. So take it away. This, this is Paul Wait on Aspen Wait Radio. I decided, um, as we only have, um, less than 12 minutes to listen to Lara that oh. we won't do the sad bit today mm -hmm. so later in the week <laughs> I will talk about um the lead singer Billy McKenzie and his legacy mm -hmm. uh and I think we'll also have them as a featured artist so um we've, so we've only really got about four minutes to talk about each of these last things so let's talk about brand uh, Lara how important mm. is is a brand do you think to a business and do all, <laughs> and do all businesses need to have one indeed I just think the most important thing to remember the, is that your brand is your identity. So it's what sets you apart from the competition. It's what gives you a personality. So branding really taps into people's emotions and senses and makes them feel more connected to your company, thus building stronger relationships. So to me, that I mean, there's several reasons why I think branding is really important. I just think more people will recognize your brand. Like if you have a strong branding for your business, people will naturally take note of it. Um, than they would a business that lacks it um, you know and a business that doesn't really have any cohesive branding isn't going to stay in someone's mind for very long um, oh. I feel it can build trust so one of the most important things you can have as a business it's not always easy to gain but you know a, brand, a business that's missing key elements of branding will have a harder time of getting people to trust them like if, it, if a company's putting a lot of effort into their branding you know that they're going to look after you too maybe um potentially yeah <laughs> hopefully um it can improve your advertising so your mm -hmm. business won't be able to get very far about advertising so branding and advertising i think go hand in hand mm -hmm. if you want to have a better advertising for your business you're going to need to work on creating that brand first and when you're advertising your business you want everything to be as cohesive as possible and represent your brand's identity and values and this can be a challenge when you haven't taken the time to form your brand I think it's also really good for any of your employees. Like, you know, if branding provides valuable sort of and value inside your company as well as outside of it. And you want your employees to love working for your company and to shout about it as well. Mm -hmm. And I think finally it kind of creates loyal customers. So, you know, you don't just want customers who recognize your brand and only use mm -hmm. your business once. You want to create customers who continue to come back. So with good branding, you can give your brand more a more human side, which your customers can relate to more than a company that's strictly all business. You know, it's personable. Yeah, I think um I think the importance of a brand is um is that when someone looks at that brand, it means something to them. You know, yeah. they look at it and they say, oh, that, 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 that engenders reliability or it engenders best of class or that engenders the best, you know, possible customer service or whatever it might be. Mm. No, Otherwise, definitely. it's pretty pointless, isn't it? Well, yeah, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's really important to invest time and, you know, money into your brand as a company. Otherwise, you're faceless, aren't you, really? Who's, you know, you can't trust someone you can't see. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, in, 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 in the SME world, I, I, I would struggle to think of... Um, very, very, very few of my clients actually would have a recognisable brand. I mean, just um, you know, obviously, one of the things we want to be doing is out um, being vulgar is um, <laughs> is is sort of um, you know get over just how 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 good 
uh, we are, you know, in terms of the skills that and services we can provide to uh, to businesses all across the country and, 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 and help them to have the same level of um, of, of, of sort of um, impact and visualization, etc., that, that we have. I remember this was just when I, this is very soon after I came up with the idea of the sort of complete business growth service. And mm. uh, I've always been a great believer in holding um, meetings in powerful places. So this was Taunton Racecourse, which um, has the most wonderful panorama. So it's in this huge room, you know, so everyone could see all across the hills uh, and all the wow. fences and everything. Um, and I, I was, this was about 2.30 in the afternoon, so I'd been chuntering on for about four hours. Uh, and somebody in the room, a guy called Andy Chapman, actually, who has a, uh, an IT company which is based in Bracken also. Big shout out to you, Andy. Um, he turned around to me and he said, um, OK, then, Paul, so are you trying to build a brand? Uh, this is a true story. So this, was, this would be probably maybe over 18 years, maybe 20 years after Asper Wait had started. And no one had ever asked me that before. True story. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually didn't know what the answer was. I remember, I can remember the question and I can remember sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, right, what do I say? Uh, and I obviously, I, you know, you can't spend all day thinking of, you know, I'll come back to you in an hour. So a few seconds later, I said, yes, I guess I am. Uh, and then he said, good. And then I asked everyone else what they thought and everyone else in the room said they thought it was good too. So that's a, <laughs> that's a true story about uh, the first time that I was conscious that I myself uh, was trying to grow a brand. So um, you've been working with us now for uh, this is your fifth month. Mm. Um, what do you what do you think? You know, being objective now, what were your first thoughts when you joined Aspen Weight, and what do you think Aspen Weight as a brand stands for? And indeed, you know, has it yeah. got has it got a brand even? I think what initially drew me to Aspen Weight was its strong sense of family and its unique USP of offering clients, you know, that complete business growth service. So everything they need to help their business be the best it can be. But most importantly, I think I, lo I loved the you know mantra that Aspen Weight were true friends of people. Right. And having been in quite some political work environments, this was really <laughs> important to me. And right. I just like that, you know, a company can come to us and it doesn't have to be accounting. It can be marketing. It can be, you know, a support. Mm. this is a service that provides everything to help you be the best you can be mm -hmm. and you know we already have a great brand and story i'm just simply with the help of the marketing team trying to e help elevate it and help us be the best we can be visually to reflect our, our brand and values and no it's interesting i mean for those of you um for those of you out there who either have a business or uh, have a um you know a dream of having a business then um I, 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 I cannot stress how important it is to have brilliant marketing. So I would say, you know, as someone myself who um, I, I would say now at, at my age, I, I now consider myself to be better at marketing than anything else I do. Um, and I think it's because I understand what marketing is all about, you know. Um, mm. But when I when I I, 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 I think Aspen Weight existed for over 20 years with, with no internal marketing capability other than uh, – anything I was able to come up with. Um, and literally within days of recruiting Ross Curry, who's still with us today, um, and, and very much, you know, epitomizes all the best, I think, that, of, of Aspen Weight. Um, I remember after de just a few days of Ross working with me, sitting there thinking, how how did I ever survive without a marketing department? Because it's, <laughs> it really, I mean, I'd say now, uh, marketing, I think it'd be true to say that marketing is, essential to everything i try to do yeah definitely and i think you know i think um you know when you if you if you people um would like to see our next magazine which is currently being produced at this moment so lara and i have been um talking about the front page for instance at the moment and um we've got so the the image i take it that as one is the steps uh steps one going up to the the doorway uh Lara. In the sky yeah yeah I, I thought that was um really quite amazingly inventive what how did you get to that again it's that whole thing of what comes first the copy or the design so you know one of my biggest things is never just create a design because it looks good like you always say it's got to have a purpose it's got to have a meaning it's got to be telling a story and i kind of just saw that and just thought do you know what as cheesy as it sounds 
the sky's the limit and we can help you get there do you know what i mean like anything the world's your oyster you can do whatever you want and you, you can get it with the help of aspen weight so i saw the 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 stairs going up into the sky and then it, it sort of disappears into this sort of empty door frame of beams of light shining out oh. and it's like we, we we've got there and you can too and it's just Brilliant. i just love the image and it's again it's it's whether you find the image first and then you find the meaning after but ideally you have the message and that tagline first and that helps find the great image right young ladies you have two and a half minutes to enlighten oh our listeners oh. about the tips <laughs> for budding designers so take it away it's good. Uh, it's a good job. I'm uh, good at speed talking. Um, so the first one I'd say is experience. So gain as much experience as you possibly mm -hmm. can. Learn on the job where possible and be willing to work for free to get a foot in the door uh, mm -hmm. before working your way up and learning along the way. Um, a degree isn't always necessary. I learn everything no. on the job. I thought degree, sorry, mm -hmm. tutors was useless to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Take risks. So do one thing creatively every day that scares you. Be bold, be brave and don't be afraid to put yourself out there. No one's going to shout about your work unless you do. Be inspired, so keep up to date with the latest trends and new and noteworthy designers um, and seek inspiration for all from all kinds of sources. Don't take it personally. So design is really subjective and don't be afraid of feedback and constructive criticism because trust me, it will make you a better and stronger designer. And it's something that I'm still learning today. I'm my own worst critic. Um, have a, like I said, have a reason behind every design decision. Don't just use an image because it looks good. Make sure you know you know what that image means, what message you're trying to convey, and what story you're trying to tell. Um, my old creative director once wisely said, "If you can't explain it in a couple of lines, it's probably not working." Um, <laughs> <laughs> similarly creativity is not nine to five so just because the idea hasn't come during office hours doesn't mean there isn't a great design there some of the best ideas present themselves to you at 4 a.m or when you're in ikea mm. hoarding tea lights and artificial plants like it will just come mm. to you and finally i'm speeding my way through this but build contact so explore and befriend the competition learn from each other grow with each other and gain as much inspiration from great talent as possible from all fields and from all walks of life and resources well that was an impressive achievement Ooh, so you did, it, you, did it, you did it in one and a half minutes so um oh, brilliant. so we've got 55 seconds to the news and end of the program <laughs> so um I, I thought that was uh, absolutely fabulous um insight from lara today um a lot of tips there for people i think listening who 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 would like to be successful or uh, who need to improve so um I, I find myself you know as as a senior citizen of business uh, I literally um, am not the same person at the end of every day as I was when I started it uh, because I want to succeed and I do take on board my weaknesses and the things I do wrong. I think one of the things that's really good about Lara is um, is how self-honest she is. And um, and as you can tell, listeners, from the way she's gone about the interview today, she says, beautifully planned. Uh, <laughs> so I think planning is essential to everything. So if you would like uh, a piece of us, uh, Lara's creative design, uh, 600 pounds a day um, take it away so hope you enjoyed today look forward to seeing you all tomorrow online on DAB and on the Aspen